Thank you. Um, Y'all are really brave. I love the fact that you are here. <clears throat> um, this thing that we get into is, is almost to me like the first child, like, like you, you have your first baby. And the first time the baby cries, you're up and you're, you know, and you're reading the books and you're, should I call the doctor? You know, and, and, and really by the fourth child, nothing freaks you out. You know, blood doesn't freak you out. I, I would do the dip test to see if they needed to be changed. You know, by the fourth child, it's like, oh yeah. You know, I mean, it just, not, yeah, ooh, nothing really freaks you out. And um, this is sort of that way too. Okay, now I know what button to press. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to just um, talk about some some amazing things. I think today. I think that you're going to love it. And I I have a team, and uh, <clears throat> in every trio there's always the smooth one. That would be Tommy Hayes, right there, Tommy. Tommy's part of our team. And then there's the smart one, and that would be Candace Roberts. And then there's the other one. And I'm the other one on this team, okay? So, so you, can, you can see Curly, that, yeah, so that would be me. But so the three of us are gonna work together today and, and, and try to get things done. My job is to create a framework for you for something called dissociative identity disorder and to, to help you to understand it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch into left brain and kind of do a, <laughs> But before I do that, I'm going to play with your heads a little bit. And so uh, I have to move fairly quick. So there's me and there's my topic. And so I am going to take as many bites as I can in the next 30 minutes or so. And I thought what I would do is to talk a little bit, <clears throat> but really not talk, demonstrate to you how your brain is both an amazing thing and it's also something that is really just an instrument. And if you know how the instrument plays, then you can play the instrument. You, it's not, we're just kind of used to it. Oh, I'm thinking blah, blah, blah. So I'm gonna mess with your heads a little bit. So we're gonna trick your brains, you ready? Okay, so here's one way we're gonna trick your brains. So as you look at that, yeah, oh, right? You know it's not moving, but it's moving, right? Because the way that your visual cortex works and the way the colors work, as you shift your eyes, your brain makes it move. And you can't stop making it move, even though you know it doesn't move. Because there's something that bypasses your logic and just manipulates the way your visual cortex color stuff works, okay? That was the easy one. Okay, so here, the other thing about our brains is everything is relative in our brains. We do comparison. So you look at those and you say, oh, a big circle on the left, little circle on the right. But if you look at it, we'll take that little circle and we'll slide it over. And you see, they're exactly the same size. But when we look at it, the way our brains work is always by comparison. That tiger is faster than that tiger. I should look out for that tiger. You know, so, so the, there's that sort of feeling. And so, okay, here's another one. So you like the parrot, great, great looking parrot, except for the fact that it's not a parrot. Some of you may have seen this already. So let me zoom in a little bit. And maybe, maybe I can help you. Okay, can you tell what it is? It's not a parrot. Okay, let me help you again. That is a woman being painted. Okay, now go back and look at the woman. Do you see the woman now? She, she is. So, so she's, looking, she's looking up in this direction with her hand over her head, and she's got one knee pulled up. And now, do you see her? Let me go back, page up again. Okay, so there she is. That's her being painted up, and now if you look back, you can see her. Has everybody got it? Um, well, if I had a pointer, I could. <clears throat> so she's, so she's, oh, I do have a pointer. Wait, wait, I have one right here. <clears throat> okay, so there's her head, and there's her arm, 
going up there. Here's her leg pulled up to her chest, and there's her leg down, and this is her, her hand, her arm holding her. Well, you'll have to figure it out later. We, we have to move on. <laughs> How many can see the woman? Okay. Now, now when you look at it, try to switch back and forth between parrot and woman, parrot and woman. See, in your, your brain, you can almost feel your brain cooking on the inside because now your brain knows, okay? And so your brain can still be fooled that it's a parrot, but knows it's a woman. And so now your brain's going, how do I perceive this? How, how, do, I, how do I do that? Okay, go ahead and play that sound. Now listen, let's fool your ears. Crank it way up. Now it sounds like it's going down, right? So to our ears, it sounds like it starts high, but it's not. It's going like this. And so part of our brain thinks it's falling, but part of our brain knows that at the end is a higher pitch than it started out in. And so it, it messes with the two parts of your audio sensor, the pitch sensor and, and the tone sensor. And so it, it plays with that and, and you go, okay, now here's, here's gonna be one. Let's mess with you again. Okay, now try this. Now you're gonna have to turn sideways so you can stick your right leg out. Okay, so turn where you can stick your, your right leg out. Stick, your, stick out your right leg and swing it in a clockwise circle, okay? And then hold up your finger like this now trace a number six with your finger, a big number six. <laughs> you, feel, you feel your leg wonder what to do? See, why? Because the, the same part of your brain is being asked to do two opposite things and it will give preference to your finger because it can see your finger and fingers are more important than legs to bodies and brains, right? And so you, you, you try to keep that going and you do this and your, your brain suddenly, you can feel it, right? You can feel it on the inside. Okay, here's, here's my favorite one. Okay, try to do that. Say the color, not the word. Say the color. Just in your head, say the color. How many of you have to stop at every one and, right? See, now, if you're a musician, you just go, oh, and you just go, Brrr, you just do it, right? And so I'm half left brain and half right brain, exactly middle. And if I consciously switch, I can just blow through that like anybody's business. But if I stop and think, it takes me, you know, five minutes to get through this. Like, yeah, no, I'm green, I'm, uh, red, you know. And so what's happening? The, two ha the, the, the left side of our brain, which is the, the numbers, statistics, ordered side of the brain, wants to read the word because that's what you were taught to do is to read stuff. The right side of our brain wants to follow the directions and just flow, but you can't think and do this. You have to flow and do this, right? You have to, like musicians get in the zone and they say, well, you know, what are you playing? I don't know, man, I'm just playing. Well, what chords are you playing? I don't know, I'm just feeling it. You know, I'm feeling it. Okay, and so there's a, there's a part of our brain that just feels it and goes. And so it, it's like sports people, they get in the zone and they do incredible things. But as soon as they stop to think about it, they fall off the trike. You know, it's like, you know, I, I'm, I'm walking a tightrope, you know. And so in the same way, when we do life, we, we take this brain, and without thinking about it, we learn how the machinery works. But the machinery can be tricked. And the machinery does things to protect us that we don't know about. And that's the whole basis of dissociative identity disorder, or what used to be called multiple personality disorder, or the dissociative continuum. Okay, so what happens is the brain begins to do things on its own unconsciously to protect the person. So let's talk about how that works. 
Yeah, handouts are coming. And I won't get to it for just a minute, okay? Okay, so let's talk about, and we'll call it DID, Dissociative Identity Disorder. When babies are born, and there's more coming back there. Um, when babies are born, they, they're, they're learning their own brains, and their brains are forming. The brain isn't fully formed until you're about 18, which should tell you something about. In fact, on the dissociative scale, adolescents are right below schizophrenics on the dissociative scale. I mean, they're right there, and they're worse than a lot of other things. That should tell you something. Um, so, but the integration naturally happens, and is there any way I can get the screen back there without messing with something? No? Okay. Thanks. Um, dissociation is, is normal. How many of you have drifted off while your wife is talking? Well, there's one liar in the group. <laughs> or driven past an exit because you were listening to something on the radio, or... You, you know, I, I drive from Nashville to Atlanta a lot, and Chattanooga sometimes doesn't even exist. You know, it's like, you know, I was talking to my daughter. She called me from Lebanon, and I was in Dalton, Georgia, and the next time I'm in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and I have no concept of taking any of the turns. You know, did I stop for gas? You know, I just, I mean, I have no idea. And why? Because my brain just put driving on autopilot, which should be scary, um, and, and so dissociation is a natural phenomenon. It's a good phenomenon. It's a right phenomenon. But what happens in dissociative identity disorder is that there's persistent childhood trauma, significant, serious sexual abuse, physical abuse, abandonment, emotional abuse, and it's continuous. And so what happens is that this natural process of integrating the brain begins to break down in children four, five, six years old. And what they do is, is they dissociate and separate themselves from the pain. It is a survival mechanism, okay? It is, it is the only way that they can survive and try to relate because here are their primary caregivers who they should trust, who they are desperately trying to bond with, and they are the pain providers as well. And so um, they begin to form separate parts of themselves to, to hold the pain. So when abuse starts, drunk dad comes home and beats up on the kids, they switch to some part of their brain that holds the pain. And when it's over, they switch back and have no memory of it, none whatsoever, so that they can relate. And if it starts again, they may create another personality to take the pain. And it becomes the choice to deal with trauma. It becomes, see, once you do it, it's like playing an old song. You can play it from memory. And so it becomes a choice. This is the, this is the purpose of it. It has a fourfold purpose. One is escape reality. If the pain starts and I can just go away, and then when the pain is over, I can come back, I don't have to bear the pain. Second thing is contain reality. That is, I can put the pain and the memories into one personality called an altar, and I can contain it there. It's like chaining up a dog. The dog can't get out if I put it in a cage, so I'm going to contain it in this other personality. And so the brain, remember when, when Satan um, goes to Eve in the garden and he says, Hath not, um, has God said you can eat from any tree of the garden? No, God said, and so, and Satan goes, God doesn't want you to be like him, knowing good and evil. So, so Eve, what, what does she do? She immediately, on the basis of two sentences from Satan, creates a whole alternate reality where God cannot be trusted where the knowledge of good and evil is key, where, there, where everything is suspicious, where I'm in the garden, but God's trying to kill me or use me, I'm a slave, Satan is good. A whole reality happens, bam, like that. So I'm driving down the highway, and I glance at a sign, and I think the sign says, report all injuries to front office. And I go to my wife, 
wow, that must be a really dangerous work site. Can you imagine? She goes, Andy, the sign said inquiries. See, and so, so I thought it said injuries, just glancing at it, and I created this whole reality. I created whole government departments that, that you would report this to. I, I created jobs and a whole parallel economy, just bam, like that in our heads. And so we can do that. You can create an imaginative world, and, and it becomes, and as you focus on parts of it, they become fully formed. So if I say, Okay, you're on the moon. Ready, go. Close your eyes, you're on the moon. You will, some of you will create spacesuits and craters and moon vehicles. And I say, okay, a friend is bounding across the moon to you, and you'll see them, and some will make them jump high and low, and you'll make them wave. And all of a sudden, you've got a whole moon world going on inside your head, okay? And if you're really good at it, if you're really right brain, you can create stuff kabam, and that's how inspiration occurs. That's how songs get written. That's how the greatest ideas occur. And that's what happens here. The third thing is separate myself from reality, and that means I want to forget. So I create an amnesic barrier. I cannot remember. It's inside of me. Some, some part of my brain knows exactly what happened and has the memories of it. So escape reality, contain it somewhere else, separate myself, and create an amnesic barrier. Okay? And so I may have 17 of those rooms, and 17 other personalities, six other personalities, three other personalities. But because I'm splitting off, then I need personalities to help me do life too, and so I create other personalities. And before you know it, I'm living, and, I, and, and if I encounter someone who's threatening, they don't see it, but I go, hmm? And I close my eyes and open my eyes, and they're talking to a different person. They're talking to the part of me that deals with difficult people. And so I begin to do life that way, okay? And, and I don't know I'm doing life that way. I think everybody does life that way. It's not schizophrenia. I'm not hallucinating. I'm not delusional. I'm dissociating. I am surviving. This is the official definition. I'll just let you read it of dissociation from the American... Psychiatric Association, something, the DISM-5 manual, no? It's a mental disorder on the dissociative spectrum from daydreaming to this. Two distinct and enduring entities or personalities. They alternately control the person. And it's not explained by ordinary forgetfulness and it's not explained by drugs, imagination, make-believe. It's none of that. It, it's a, it is a serious, enduring thing. And it always deals with two things. Identity, who am I? And memory, what do I remember? Okay? So if you think of that, that will help you. Who am I? And what do I remember? So you will then encounter people who have this. Probably 1% to 3% of everybody in San Antonio has this going on in their life to some extent. 1% to 3% is the best guess out there now. This happens young, and people tend to live with it, cope with it. You tend to be fairly elastic in your uh, teen years, and everything else is going on in your teen years, so this is just one more thing. But as you get into your 20s, the amnesia barriers begin to break down. Your ability to cope begins to erode. Your ability to hold a job, to stay in a marriage. You start abusing alcohol. You might get suicidal or depressed. You hear voices. You, things begin to not go right. And you think to yourself, something is wrong. Your mate goes, I, I just, I don't know who you are anymore. Okay? And so there's, there's kind of a thing. Um, there's a long list of symptoms in the handout. <clears throat> so the outward function begins to be more and more quirky. They may find clothes in their closet, and they don't know where they got the clothes. Time is lost. It'll be 1 o'clock, and the next thing you know, it's 4 o'clock, and there's 40 miles more on their car, and it's out of gas, and they're at a grocery store, and they go, huh, I wonder how I got here, Right? I mean, this sounds beyond truth, but this is exactly what happens. 
okay? This is exactly what happens. So there's, there's outward some quirkiness, and so what they learn to do is to cope and to hide. So there's secrets, secrets, secrets. So people who are DID are masters at going with the flow. So they all of a sudden find themselves with people they don't know, and they just go, oh, hi, um, and they just listen for the name, and, they just, they fi- and so they just find ways to cope, to understand. Okay, this sounds like, I, this sounds like I'm making this up, but I, I can absolutely tell you for, for a fact, this is the life that some people live, okay? Um, inward chaos. If you think of the inward world, if you, if you had 12 people in you of all different ages, races, sexes, without a school teacher, it's like a schoolroom of part delinquents and part good students, part old, part young, different races, and the teacher leaves the room and puts nobody in charge for life, that's what it feels like on the inside. So, so the parts of them begin to negotiate with, with each other. And Well, I do this. Well, my job is this. Well, well, I handle this. So the first point is this. People suffering from DID are the least of those. If you go into this, you'll be doing probably the coolest thing you'll ever do. Okay? They're like, ah, um, uh, yeah, I've got seven or eight uh, young women that my wife and I work with, and they're just precious people. They're just incredibly precious people. We had a birthday party for one and gave age-appropriate gifts for all the kids, and she said it was the best thing that ever happened to her. You go to a restaurant, and she cannot figure out what to order because half the voices in her head want hot dogs, and the other half want kale. You know, and you just and so she would just give the menu to the, the waitress and say, "Pick something, surprise me," okay? Because she could not make a decision because the voices were everybody want, and so you can hear it's like it's like a, a, a committee to do everything. What should we wear today? I want jeans, I like jeans. No, we need to wear a dress. And so, so inside there's just chaos. <clears throat> so what is an alter? What are these alternate personalities? Um, this is the actual definition then out of the, out of the um, counselors, uh, DISM-5, I forget the actual name of it, but um, so it's a firm, persistent, and well-founded sense of self it has characteristic and consistent personality and pattern of behavior and feelings. Alters can be different ages, different sexes, different races. Um, I have a friend who, whenever she drives, a 16-year-old boy alter drives because he likes driving, and everybody inside lets that one drive. So I talked to him. I said, are you a good driver? Are you a safe driver? Don't, don't hurt my rest of my friends. And he's like, I won't. I'll be careful. Okay. And see, so... so what a wacko life. Oh, yeah, I've got, I, I knew I was going to. Thank you so much. I know I'm susceptible to uh, the compassionate part. Um, there may be personality fragments. In other words, one personality part just has a job to do. So my job is to take the beatings. And so I don't need to develop a full-blown personality, just enough personality to do that. Okay. Another one says, we're, they all say we, we're ter- terrible with money, so my job is to balance the checkbook and handle the money. Okay. So they all talk in terms of we. Where are we going to go? And because why? Because you're making decisions for a committee on the inside. I know for some of you, you're going, we, really? Yeah. This is exactly, you know. <clears throat> um, Switching can happen often. Sometimes switching is very, very subtle. The person is learning how to cope. All of the parts play the game with each other well because they do not want to be found out. Okay? Sometimes it's fairly dramatic. Um, Sometimes it's instantaneous. The alters can be co-conscious. That is, they may all know about each other, or they might know about some of them but not the rest of them. Sometimes they're just one-way conscious. I know about them, but they don't know about me. I watch them, but they don't, they don't know I'm watching them. 
okay? Sometimes they're, they're totally unaware. You can have a little one in a dungeon who holds the pain and another one keeping them in there so the pain doesn't get out. And the little one in the dungeon has no idea about anything in life. Okay? You can have a host who, whose job it is to kind of coordinate things. Okay? You can have a protector whose job it is, is to protect the rest of the system from pain or, or to keep the pain in, for example. You can have a child, and it's typically children who hold the pain and are locked away someplace in the system. You can have a persecutor. You can have some very dysfunctional, they can think they're demons even. They, they feel like they have to punish themselves, and, and they, there's, there's cutting and, and suicide attempts and drugs and uh, just, you know, there's one, Martinez was, was her name, and, and I'm sitting at a church Wednesday night dinner talking to 15 different people across the table from me in one person. I knew how weird my life got when I was sitting at a church dinner going, okay, let me talk to Martina. She doesn't want to talk to you. Why? She doesn't like you. Oh, I like her. Come on. Martina, come on. Get out here. I need, you know, I see it's like, and you're thinking, what a weird life I live. But see, when you treat it like it's not weird, it's just them. It's like someone who speaks three languages and they're, they're not good in one language, so they switch, so you switch with them. They're not stupid because they do that. That's just who they are. And so in the same way, so Martinez and I made friends, but she still cusses me out. Every time she saw, she saw me, she still cussed me out. I don't need my, 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 my. I said, oh, knock it off. You know, and so, and so she would smile because she knew she's trying to provoke me, right? So some, some have personalities like that. Some are internal helpers. They know a whole lot what's going on. And when they find somebody they trust, they will begin to share insights, incredible insights about the structure about how it came into being. Some hold part of the history and some hold the rest of the history. So if you want the whole history, you gotta talk to different ones. Well, what, it's like talking to a family about family history. Well, I wasn't there when Uncle John did that. Oh yeah, but this one was. So you, and see, so you get, you see how it is? It's, it's like a whole family inside that has all the same weirdness that any family has, but it's all inside of one person. Um, yeah, they may be part of a group, so there may be a cluster over here that do things together. The average number of altars is about 13, um, but there can be two, there can be 100. Candace is going to talk all about this. She is like the... Altars are not demons. You cannot cast out an altar. You can try, and nearly everybody that I've worked with, someone tried to cast out an altar and call it a demon and stick a Bible under their nose and about destroyed them. So we ju there's just a lot of religious, weird, charismatic stuff that goes on. Not even charismatic, it's just weird. So over on one side, you have the, 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 the traditional church that thinks they're just strange. We need to get them out of the church somehow, ease them out, put them into counseling, put them on uh, drugs of some kind, get them to psychotherapy. And then you have the weird church that's trying to cast out demons. And they're just going, I just want to be understood. I just want to be loved and accepted. Okay, and see, that's why we're here. That's why you're here. You're going to run into this. Um, there's a difference between demons and altars. Demons are not human. Altars are human. And so this is not how we do it. This is the wrong approach. Um, these are kids, okay? These are little kids. Don't say grow up. You may as well tell your five-year-old, oh, would you just grow up and be an adult? We need to grow you all up. No, no, you don't. Okay, Candace will talk a lot more about it. So that's not the right. This is the right way. Jesus said, let the children come to me. Children came to Jesus even when their parents didn't tell them to. Okay? And he said, if you mess with one of these little ones, it would be better if you just jumped overboard with a brick tied to your head, then mess with one of these, okay? And that's who these are, they're little ones. And, and a lot of them are, some are older. And so our job is to make ourselves safe and trusting, trustworthy, totally safe. Until you're safe, you have no business doing anything. Secondly, to help them know that Jesus is safe. And then everything that you know already how to do in freedom prayer, whatever you call it, everything you know how to do works with every one of those altars because they're people, right? And so at that point, you know 90% about how to minister and befriend people like this. 
you just understand that I'm, I really, you could charge extra for each one who, you know, you know some have tried. Okay, so um, with that, <clears throat> I wanted to mention something, and there's a paragraph maybe at the very, towards the end, but we use this dissociation idea with people who have defense mechanisms. So dissociation is an extreme defense mechanism. But have you ever tried to minister to somebody, or maybe this is you or your mate, don't look left or right now, um, where they're just kind of in their head and they don't let feelings happen? And so you're ministering to them and they're just kind of flatlining. And so what, what we'll do sometimes is to go, you know, um, we're having trouble getting to the, the part of you that's really in pain, kind of like that inner part in you. I wonder if it would be okay if the part of you, notice my language, the part of you alters our part of the person. They're not another person. If the part of you that keeps the pain on the inside from being having a voice, would it be okay if you stepped aside? Sometimes we go, brain guy. You've been doing such a good job protecting the little one from the pain. You've been doing an awesome job. I wonder if you're tired and would take a break. Would you be willing to trust Jesus to interact with the little one on the inside who is hurt? And it's incredible. They go, yeah. You know, it's, it's, like, it's like when you talk in that language, no one's surprised at that language because they've been operating that way all along. Even, so even if they're not dissociated, defense mechanisms are sort of the precursor to dissociation. And so we can use this as a tool. And so, so I'll, I'll call him Dave, pastor of a major church somewhere in the U.S., and we're with Dave. And um, he's, he's doing the pastor thing. You know, well, yes, well, and... You know, in uh, Second Chronicles uh, 25, 7, not that many people know this verse. You know, and you just kind of go, <sighs> and so finally, my friend said, you know, we're either going to go to lunch or we're going to get someplace right here. So would it be okay, Dave, not his real name, Dave, if the part of you that is professional and has the right answers and protects the little one on the inside who's really hurting, would it be okay if you rested? Would that, how does that feel to you? And, you know, he kind of thinks, he goes, well, and I go, would you trust Jesus? Would you be willing to give that job to Jesus just for 10 minutes and just rest? Yeah, I, I guess that would be okay. Would it be okay if the little one had a voice? Yeah. And so you just say, okay, thank you. Just rest, and just wait a second, and then you say, I'd like to talk to the little one now who's, who's hiding on the inside. I want to give you a voice. You haven't had a voice. And Austin here, okay, what are you feeling? What's your name? How are you doing? And off we go. Pretty soon, the story comes out. He's hiding in a doghouse. He'd been beat up. And he made a pact with the demon for protection. And that pact echoed through his whole life. And he can't get rid of it. And brain guy keeps him in the doghouse, thinks he's protecting him, but he's imprisoning him. And so there's this catch-22 that you always see in this ministry where you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. You're in terrible pain where you are, but any other direction is just as painful and a lot more scary. And so we just did what we always do. Jesus, is it okay if Jesus comes? Yeah. Jesus, would you show him where you were when that happened? Oh, oh, he's right there. Would you like, yeah, would you like to break that covenant, that pact you made with that demon? Oh, yeah, okay. Let's go ahead, lead him through it. Bam, they break it. Where is Jesus? Oh, he's bringing me out. Oh, we're going to Austin. Oh, we're at a lake. Oh, you know, you're just, you're just watching. And all of you have had this experience. You're just watching this. And so... Somebody in a very religious setting would go, well, none of that is real. And you go, how the heck do you know? It's real to them. You think the book of Revelation wasn't real because John was still on the Isle of Patmos? Give me a break. It's in the Bible. <laughs> it's real. You think Paul's vision when he said, I don't know if I was in the body or not in the body, but I saw things? You think that wasn't real? 
Let the person have their time with Jesus. And so uh, he emailed me about two weeks later, and he said, I've told every elder they need to, they need to either come to Nashville or we'll come down here because this is incredible. He said, I walk around like a whole new person. I look on the inside, and there's just no pain there. And all there is is Jesus. And you go, yeah, come on. That's what, this is more real than, I don't know, a lot of things. I don't want to. So where's more? Okay, we're going to switch gears. Come on up, Tommy. We're going to switch gears, um, and there'll be a Q&A Q soon.